Oh, it is recording. And we are back. All right. After a recovery from strep throat this weekend, uh, we are going to dive into equities. And I really uh, enjoy very much being an academic because then I can talk about things that make CNBC hosts scream in frustration and anger online. And if you don't believe me, uh, check out a Jim Cramer clip back, back in the day when the Great Recession was beginning and Lehman and Bear Stearns were starting to go down. Uh, CNBC host Jim Cramer kind of loses it on TV. And he usually deals with equities and stocks, right? But he talks a lot about the Fed. He talks a lot about monetary policy and the potential effects it can have on stock prices and especially in the aggregate, say the S&P 500 uh, and also individual stocks. So what we are going to do today is approach equities, not from the approach you'd get in your FIN 3320 courses, but rather from a monetary perspective. And remember the four services of money are a medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value, and speculative assets. So when you change something about any of these four services, they affect each other. We saw this in the bond markets. We saw this in the money markets. We're going to see it now in the equity markets, and we'll see it also when we start the bank capital videos as well. So if you have time, and, and I'll post this YouTube video up as well. Uh, it, like I said, it's a classic, guys. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to watch, and it's kind of funny, but I want this to be a point where you start thinking about equity markets from the lens of monetary policy and what the Federal Reserve is doing. So the main quote that I want to point to in Jim Cramer's frustrated rant is he, and he's referring specifically to the then chairman Ben Bernanke of the Federal Reserve, has no idea what it's like that up there. None. And Bill Poole, that would be the president of the New York Fed who helps the Federal Reserve enact monetary policy, he has no idea what it's like out there. And I'm he's screaming at this point. So the YouTube video is much funnier. My people have been in this game for 25 years. They are losing their jobs. These firms are going to go out of business and it's nuts. They're nuts. They know nothing. He goes on to talk about Ben Bernanke being an academic when this is no time to be an academic. Now, that's the part where I disagree with Jim Cramer because I feel like this is the perfect time to be an academic. And so that's what we're going to do in this equity lecture. So let's, from an academic standpoint, delve into equities. Now, again, much like money, we want to kind of step back and remember those four services, medium of exchange, store of value, unit of account, and speculative asset. Equities are a claim to, excuse me, mm, stomach hasn't recovered from this weekend quite fully. Equities are a claim to share in net income of assets of some corporation, right? Common stock. You have a claim to their uh, ownership and you have a claim to their income. This gives you a right to vote in the decisions of the firm and a right to the cash flows, of course, after uh, more prioritized claims against some of these assets are paid. So remember, a bond is kind of like a, a loan, right? You're, you are exchanging your store of value for some liquidity or you're getting some um, some liquidity by pushing out a store of value. Now with ox, with stocks, wow, I may need to, uh, I may need to take a, a little bit of a caffeine interruption here. My apologies. With stocks, what you are doing is you are getting a claim of ownership, okay? So then how is that a medium of exchange or a store of value? Well, it's a speculative asset, right? You're speculating whether the value of this company is going to go up or down on this secondary stock market. You could also be paid in dividends. These are period payments to stockholders, right? So some stocks pay dividends, some don't. The thing we want to think about is how that affects their price, right? how the price is going to change, whether they have dividends or don't have dividends. Bonds don't have dividends. Dollar bills don't have dividends. In fact, even with a dollar bill, remember, that's not a claim of ownership. That's a representation of value and medium of exchange that you have and that you currently possess and can exchange for goods and services. But you, uh, in the terms of that piece of paper, don't own that. 
If the Treasury comes out and says $100 bills will be uh, discontinued in next year and you guys need to exchange any hundreds you have for any 50s, 20s, 5s, and 1s, which we'll still accept, then that piece of paper suddenly loses its value. So you can't really say there's a claim to ownership of that. It represents the value you have, yes, but it is not a claim to ownership in the same way a stock is, right? Okay, so to have that there. Now, I'm going to put up the Gordon growth model, which is one way to try and price stocks that gain dividends. Is it important to me that you always use the Gordon growth model? Not at all. This is just the one you see in the textbooks. And what I want to do is I want to focus on a few implications of what happens when interest rates prevailing in the market change, specifically what happens to stock prices. Okay. So here's the Gordon growth model. This is a beautiful equation. I love this equation. It's just so simple and neat. It's elegant. This is a wonderful little equation here, but P naught then is the price of a stock right now at time period zero. How much the stock is worth right now as we're observing it. D naught is that dividend that is paid in that period that you are observing this stock price. G is the growth rate of that dividend payment, how much more we are expecting to get as this company profits more or, or maybe less, right? I'm trying to be optimists here. And KE is the required return on an investment in that equity, okay? So you've got a few things that are influencing the price on the market, the dividend paid, how much the dividend has been growing, and how much return needs there uh, does there need to be in order to convince you to jump in on that stock right so g here we're going to treat as constant again this is a simple model uh, of course the growth rate's not going to be constant in reality there are some better models that you can look into for this but for the sake of simplicity g is going to be constant and the other thing we notice about that is g is going to be strictly less than this required return on investment okay uh, if it's equal, then we divide by zero, and that's bad. Never divide by zero, right? The universe will implode on itself. Uh, so the main thing that is least important for this a monetary economics is this concept of the required return on an investment in that equity. So let's dig into this. This is the amount of return on an equity that you want from that stock. If you're not getting it, then, then you don't make that investment, right? Again, this is this is also nice in supporting that second assumption, right? That that the KE uh, is going to be strictly uh, sorry, strictly greater than the G, the growth rate of that dividend. Do you want 12%? Do you want 6%? Your demand preferences are going to shape the price of these equities because equities, remember, it's just a market. There's going to be demand. There's going to be supply. Demand is going to change, and that price will move up and down based on the change in that demand. So YG, um, strictly less than KE, because if this happens, then the size of the firm would just explode to an impossibly large number, and mathematically, it doesn't make sense, right? So we have these limits going on within this model. There are some assumptions that we're making about reality that needs to be followed. So what does this mean for stock purchasers? Okay, so if we think of this required return on investment, well, what's the return on alternatives to equities? What's the return on cash? What's the return well, on zero, right? Or well, inflation is the punishment you get for that, right? What's the return on savings, CDs, money market mutual funds? These are lower risk and lower return uh, more liquid assets, right? The nice thing about equities uh, is that they tend to be fairly liquid, easily easy to trade, probably more easy to trade than bonds, uh, but they do have a higher risk, so they're going to need a higher return. If these returns on the market are falling to zero, if the returns to savings rates and CDs and money markets fall to zero, where are you going to store your value over time? Excuse me one minute while I pause this video. 
Okay, so I've resumed recording. If we are at a zero lower interest rate return on CDs, money market mutual funds, where do you go for store value? You can go into stocks, you can go into crypto, you can go into a number of different kinds of investments, which traditionally are for speculation. The issue being is that it becomes more risky, right? To get that store of value, you're now taking on more risk. So a lower return on monetary assets, the lower return on medium of exchange and store of value means a lower acceptable return for savers to purchase stocks instead. So we are being incentivized through low interest rates to gamble more, not because we want a return on investment, not because we want to speculate, but because there is no other alternative to getting higher return on store of value. Lower interest rates usually stimulate the economy. That also leads to higher dividends. So that G, uh, remember we assumed it's constant. If we find a better model that has a dynamic growth in dividends, then that increases, right, based on that monetary stimulus. So monetary stimulus will end up raising stock prices by this model, right? Now, if it happens in reality, that, that's the question we're going to take a look at empirically. But by this pricing model, if we lower interest rates across the board in the macro economy, we are going to be raising stock prices. If we go into a monetary contraction, that would end up lowering these stock prices by doing the opposite of what we just talked about here, right? Monetary contraction means you're raising those interest rates up. So then there's going to be a higher, accept, uh, higher um, acceptable return on stocks that you, in order to make that decision, right? On top of that, uh, higher interest rates usually contracts the economy, leading to lower dividends, okay? So the opposite right of what I'm talking about here. Let's then take a look at stock prices empirically. Now, all right, the Econ 2301, uh, we're you know just introduced to inflation. We're watching CNBC and Fox Business and reading the Wall Street Journal. Um, this is how we would look at those stock prices. This is the S&P 500 composite index. It's what you see reported on every day. And I'm taking this back to 1871 to give you guys an idea of how this is measured and how it's potentially grown over time. And you can see going back to 1871, this comes from uh, the Case Schiller data uh, or the Schiller data that's available on his website. And there should be a link to that in Blackboard. You can download it. But you can see that uh, stock prices are really, really low. Dynamics are squished from the 1870s into the 1960s. And then we have this takeoff in 1991. Uh, and we have this really big takeoff uh, in the wake of, of the Great Recession, right? Now, I want you to think of stocks, remember, in terms of demand and supply for speculation and store of value. Now, there's a lot of good reason why you'd see a takeoff in the wake of the Great Recession, because in a zero interest rate environment, demand for those equities as a store of value and a speculative tool is rising and rising and rising, because where else are you going to go? Can't go to a savings account, can't go to bonds, can't, you know, zero rates will be eaten away by any potential inflation. So, of course, demand is going to increase for those equities. So, we see these variations. The problem with this measure, the problem with the Econ 2301, watching CNBC everyday measure, is that this is nominal. It's not inflation adjusted. So while we may talk about uh, the crash, right, 1929 into the 1930s, we don't see it from these prices because they're not inflation adjusted dollars. They're not real value. Now, this is a bad measure because it's not showing the historical pain, right? 1929 was worse than 2007. That, that, is, that, that should be an objective statement, right? 1929 was worse than 2007, but we don't see it measured here. So now going into Econ 4312, now you guys need to start using better measures. So let's account for inflation, right? Okay, the problem is, that fall right there, I mean, yeah, it's really big relative to everything around here. But again, 1929 was worse than 2007, right? 
we can make arguments that 1929 was worse than 2020, uh, but you know, we can go back and forth on that one anyway. Uh, so we're not seeing this kind of crash and this kind of pain that we would expect this measure to give us, right? We want these measures to demonstrate what is going on in the economy. This is why uh, the Fed really likes the PCE inflation measure because it was more accurately capturing the pain that was felt in the 1970s during the stagflation. The GDP deflator was very undervalued in terms of inflation, whereas CPI and PCE were demonstrating a lot more pain felt by the consumer. So this is an okay measure, right? This is good enough for the C in 4312. What I want from you guys, especially if you're gonna be dealing with my retirement portfolio, is think of, think of equities as a different beast here, okay? So one of the much better measures is the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, again, provided by Bob Schiller. All right, so you can think of this as uh, the real stock price at time T, divided by the average earnings of the company over the past 10 years. So the ratio of the real price divided by the average real earnings index over the past 10 years. This is sometimes called the PE10 or the CAPE, I sometimes say the CAPE ratio. What this does, since again, we see the pain in the real stock price, but we don't, it doesn't, seem as large, I mean, especially like 2000 to 2001, that's a huge dip in real stock prices. Shouldn't that be catastrophic when compared to a similar crash, 1929 into 1930? Well, what we want to try and do then is benchmark these um, volatile swings to how were the companies doing over the past 10 years? And then we may get a better idea looking at all of this data that's going on back here, how they were doing versus how they're doing here versus how they're doing here. So we're gonna benchmark prices to the earnings of companies within that index. Uh, so is the stock price overvalued or undervalued relative to the real performance of these firms? And now, and this, this, is, this is why Schiller got a Nobel Prize, guys, right? Because this is a really great measure. Now, we, well, okay, I think he got it for other reasons technically, but on a mountain of other reasons why Schiller should have gotten a Nobel Prize. This is up there, right? 1929, that drop looks spectacular. We see it. We see the kind of stagnation throughout the 30s that follows after it. 2000, yes, we see this large drop, and definitely there was a lot of overvaluation going on in 2007 or 2000, but we don't see, um, we don't see, say, you know, the like this is a little bitty, this isn't a little bitty stock price crash. This is a crash, right? This is a crash here. And then we have 2007 as a crash and here we've got 2021. So this is more reflective of that pain. Now, when we look at this measure, again, I like zero. I like having above zero good, below zero bad. And sometimes above zero bad, below zero good, right? Depending on what we've got here. Now we can't really say, you know, above or below zero good or bad. I could maybe add a bit of a trend line and say, hey, we're overvalued relative to our overall trend, undervalued, overvalued, undervalued. But you know what? I really miss that zero line and so does the Fed. So what we have here is what's called the Fed model or the excess CAPE yield. So we have the inverse of the CAPE index minus the 10-year real interest rate. So now what we're doing, uh, much like where we have, say, the inflation gap, where we compare inflation to that target of 2%. Now we're looking at these benchmarked returns for the S&P 500 relative to the 10-year Treasury bond. Is it above it? Is it below it? And if we have above, then we generally think, okay, potentially overvalued. If we have below, okay, then undervalued. So um, you would sometimes call this the Fed model if you're using a nominal real interest rate. Uh, I believe that Schiller encourages people to use a real interest rate, right? We want that inflation to be adjusted. So this is the excess return investors expect from taking on that risky purchase of share in a company versus the less risky return on bonds. Okay, so here we have, are we overvalued relative to the safe, quote unquote, safe return we get from the government? 
or are we undervalued relative to that? And when we adjust the model for that, then we get this very nice, you know, above zero, below zero. Now we probably want above zero here because we want that return. We want to get more return from taking on that risk. And we can see in cases that this has crashed and that sentiment can be undervalued as well. Here's the Keynesian animal spirits, right? And when we look at this benchmark to the 10 year interest rate, again, we see the massive overvaluation of the stock market, 19 teens into the 1920s. And we see that crash. We see that crisis in 1929. And you can look at this graph and you can feel it. Now you can also see that decreasing uh, overvaluation into undervaluation of the 1950s, but it doesn't go below zero, right? We don't have the full on crisis here, but we certainly see this more undervaluation of this risk in stock, or I'm sorry, smaller overvaluation of risk in stock relative to government uh, bond returns. Then an overvalue in this stock throughout the 70s and then back down throughout the 90s. Uh, here we have, there should be a, a smaller minimum point here, all right? And that undervaluation almost in, in 2000, right? And then we, here we have again, this kind of overvaluation, again, returning. And we have, like I said, that nice above zero, below zero above zero, overvalued, and you want a bit of overvaluation. Again, we, we do want above zero, kind of like we want some moderate inflation, right? We want that above zero because we want those people taking on the risk of their ownership shares and companies to get compensated, right? We don't want it undervalued. We want it to be somewhat overvalued. When you see undervaluation, then something has happened, right? Okay, but we also don't want excessive overvaluation. So, you know, again, what do I keep saying in this class? Uh, you know, three main answers to this class. 2%, the Taylor rule, blame the Fed. How am I, I mean, why has Ben, not Ben Bernanke, why is Jim Cramer blaming Ben Bernanke for what's going on in 2008? Why is Jim Cramer uh, begging the Fed to intervene in the markets? Why is Jim Cramer screaming on live TV uh, potentially damaging his credibility, potentially damaging his reputation, of course, as we've all learned from reality TV, uh, you know, the louder the better, right? But does Fed policy really have such an effect on these capital bond and equity stock markets? If the Fed raises funds, do we see a clear relationship between the Fed contracting the money supply, raising rates, or expanding the money supply, lowering rates? And that is a tricky question. So if we look at the relationship between the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio and the 10 year treasury bond, it's, it's not, I, I can't say a whole heck of a lot about it, right? Our goodness of fit is about 8%. I mean, it looks kind of like there is a relationship. Uh, do bond markets behave as this kind of substitute speculation, right? Our bond markets, the store of value and our equities, the speculative asset, this is not a clear picture from the empirical data. And okay, uh, Kramer and I are blaming the Fed. Is that story borne out? And from recent uh, quarters, recent I'm defining as going back to about 2006, 2007, well, we have the zero lower bound period of the Federal Reserve. And it looks like, hey, at the lowest that these nominal rates can go, we have the C CAPE going up a lot and going down a lot. So that's not a very good story either. But remember what I'm talking about with monetary markets and bond markets, that the interest rate is not the price. The opportunity cost is the price. That's why we did the CAPE minus 10-year bond, because think of it this way. What is the opportunity cost of purchasing the stock versus instead buying a 10-year bond? The opportunity cost is the difference in the returns. So let's take the difference between the 10 year bond and the federal funds rate. So I'm kind of cheating here by throwing in monetary policy through that Fed funds rate here. But what about the price of holding a 10 year bond versus the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio? And the relationship becomes much clearer. We begin to see as holding bonds 
gets, uh, let's see here, we have the 10 year minus the Fed funds as holding these bonds get in this case, more and more expensive mm -hmm. yeah. as that opportunity cost is rising for holding on to these bonds we see the price of stocks beginning to go down if we see the opportunity cost go negative then what we see here is the price of bonds go up do we have a substitution effect then here between these bonds uh, and these price to earnings ratio and the answer is yes it's, we're substituting for store of value and speculation yes that's what we are seeing from this empirical data. Now, are we always going to see that? No, remember, this is the recent data, 2006, 2007. There are animal spirits in the market and we can go back and we can argue over different interpretations, but you want to look at spreads. You want to look at whether or not we are getting more from holding on to long-term versus short-term. If we get more from holding on to long-term, we're not as likely to take that risk in the stock market. Demand for stocks then falls, price of stocks goes down. If on the other hand, holding on to short-term assets as related through a uh, zero lower interest with the Fed funds and then the 10-year bonds crashing down with it almost towards zero, as we get less and less return, almost negative, well, and even into negative return, then those stocks become a lot more attractive. Demand is going up and that price relative to those earnings is increasing, 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 and we get overvaluation. So that's where the mechanism comes in here. If the Fed makes money really, really cheap, that's great for medium of exchange. That's not so great for store of value. So yes, 2% Taylor rule, blame the Fed. Now, um, we do need to talk about efficiency. Are markets efficient? Well, if we have rational expectations, if expectations are identical to the best guess of the future using all the available information, that's what rational means in this context, okay? Not that you're making wise decisions, not that you're making uh, good decisions, but you're making rational decisions given the information available, okay? And you could, be ha you could have bad information all around, right? You could have bad information and still make a rational decision based on that bad information, okay? So I'm not saying we're making good choices. I'm saying we're making the best choices relative to information available, all right? So, um, you know, if I think the world is flat, then, well, rationally, if I want to jump off the edge of the world, I just keep walking. Now, of course, I'll be walking forever because I come around to one point and go round and round and round. So if there's a change in how an indicator behaves, then the expectations on that indicator are going to change as well. If there's something different about the S&P 500, people are going to respond to that difference. If there's something different about the Fed funds rate, people are going to respond to that difference. The errors in one's forecast on average become zero, and it becomes unpredictable. This leads to what's called the efficient markets hypothesis. The price of this equity will reflect all available information. So, hey, the price that you're observing right now, we know everything about the rate of return on the investment. We know everything on dividend growth. We know about dividend level. Um, so that means that we cannot forecast this. If we have uh, all of this information available and the market is efficient, then it is not predictable because all of the available information is already reflected in the price. Okay, so let's talk about certain uh, myths, particular myths that may come of it. So that means stock markets are stable. Not at all. Rationality does not imply stability. Efficiency does not imply stability. Um, there are very much possibilities for bubbles to go up and around those fundamentals in an efficient market where we have this information to make these rational decisions, okay? So even in an ideal case, even in a uh, you know physics without gravity type model situation, we can't predict what's going on. So there are still bubbles. There are there's still instabilities. There's still all this frothiness that can come into the market. Okay, so basically what this means is financial market prices reflect those fundamentals one investment is as good as any other because prices are correct. 
Price reflects the security's intrinsic value. Again, this is that ideal world, right? That no gravity physics question model. Prices can be used to assess firm cost to capital accurately, that our managers are making good decisions. Even in these cases, what we find is that there can still exist crashes and bubbles. And assets fall or rise well beyond their fundamental values. And these are not predictable. And that is in line with competitiveness, with efficiency, with rationality. So remember, the, fundament, uh, the, the, the bubbles that, that happen, the bubbles and crashes that happen are not, they don't have to be due to some kind of market imperfection or market inefficiency. We could be living in a perfectly competitive market and be very, very efficient, and the stability of the market may still be very, very volatile, right? So just keep that in mind as we uh, further go on looking at different kinds of store of value, speculation, and medium of exchange. Thank you, guys. My apologies for the pause in the middle of this.